Thank you. Uh, quite some people, well organized. Although I have some doubts, I must say. I was, I was looking around downstairs and I saw a scrum clinic. <laughs> and I felt like a, a clinic for scrum. Also, that's where you get healed from scrum. <laughs> where, where people are going to cure you from this thing called scrum, right? That's, that's why, why you go to a clinic. So I'm not, not really sure what's going to happen over there. At least I'm, I'm happy to, to be back. Um, let, let me start by showing this little quote. It's from a little book I wrote uh, back in, in 2013. Now, you're, you're German, so you're famous for not mastering English, is that right? So, so let me show you the same, but then in German. <laughs> <laughs> because it took a while, but in 2017, Peter and, and uh, Peter's over there and Uwe decided to translate my little book into German. As, as it was in English, it was called Scrum, a pocket guide, and in German, it's Scrum Taschenbuch. Now, the, the, I'm going to try to, to, to pronounce a sort of subtitle. So, Ein Wegweiser für den Bewussten Entdecker. How beautiful is that? Eh? <laughs> Not how I pronounce it, but the way that they wrote about it. So, that's cool. So, sort of what, what this statement says, and I sort of eroded down in, in 2013, still, still believe in it. Um, at some point in time, we will see the situation where Scrum will just become the norm, the standard way of working, meaning we will not have to consciously think about it all the time, not be so much focused on the process, but more on the behavior, the interactions, the accountabilities, and so on. And it will become natural. And, and it's still my belief that um, organizations will, what I call by then, reinvent themselves around it. But so we're sort of five years from that. I still believe that. But I think we can, we can push that a little bit. And like GP says, like, uh, it's really good to have great people attending a conference. We need great people out there just doing Scrum, promoting Scrum, helping people understand Scrum, um, certainly challenging uh, organizations a little bit. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So this was my, my book, 2013, translated in 2017. And um, since then, I've been thinking about, about sort of a new book, also invited by my publisher. Oh, but in the beginning, I must say, this is a bit strange. So I wrote my book in 2013. It's like, okay, we're done now. Everything is said about Scrum. All said. No, no books needed anymore. People still write about it, but still it's not needed anymore. So it took me a while to get over that and then start thinking about new book and then uh, my publisher inviting me to do so. And, and I, sort of my, my, my thinking was, why do we need a book around Scrum? You know, and this, this agile thing, it's around 2001. It's 17 years old. Do we still need that? Because if, if I feel like I don't have like sort of that sort of purpose, that sort of why for a new book, why would I, why would I spend all that energy and, and into it? So then I started thinking about it and, and so, sort of came to the maybe surprising conclusion that probably Agile is more needed than ever. It's probably the most misunderstood terms nowadays because everything is Agile. We put just an Agile in front of whatever we have in place and we call ourselves Agile. Um, so maybe with not getting the idea of Agile across. Honestly, I think that the term Agile is still very powerful. We haven't been really good at explaining it, but I don't think the fact that we've not been able to really explain it is going to be solved by giving it new names. Because there's some movements around the world that try to think that, oh, we have to give Agile a new name and then people will finally get it. I think if they didn't understand sort of the old Agile, they won't understand the new Agile either. So that's sort of the same problem. So let's just stick to the idea of Agile. Now, the purpose of Agile or the value of Agile is sort of, it is how I try to represent it. I've um, been thinking about a way to represent sort of complexity. I know there are existing models, but I don't feel comfortable with any existing model. I need to find sort of my own language, my own words in explaining stuff. So I've been thinking a little bit about um, expressing it like this. And we'll see how this resonates with you. Um, sort of thinking about, okay, we're in this highly complex world where we have people or players, sort of the who needs to do the work. We have something like what needs to be done, activities, call it whatever you want. Um, sort of what do we need to produce? So there's a sort of who, how, what do we need to produce? And what I, what I miss in a lot of sort of explanations of complexity and uncertainty in a way is sort of what I would call the environment. The fact that we have not only to do complex work, it's need to be done by people. We're not robots, we're not replaceable pieces of machinery. We're highly <laughs> complicated, complex creatures that are very unpredictable, which is cool, but not, not 
Not always that fun, but still. But what I miss a little bit is the fact that we're doing highly complex creative work by highly complex creative um, uh, creatures called humans in, in often very, very uh, difficult and complex circumstances. So I wanted to add that a little bit. Sort of a little bit of a, a model and then thinking what I also don't like about a lot of models is sort of those very clear uh, delineations. Yeah, you're in that one region and then there's sort of very strict borders, sort of black and white, and then you jump across that. I don't think that sort of life, life is about gradual changes and so on. Sort of, sort of sfumato principle, uh, if everybody would know that from paintings, but still. So I've been thinking about this a lot and said, well, let's, let's sort of simplify things again. We've got already enough people, that sort of self-acclaimed experts that just complicate stuff. So let's, let's try to do the opposite and simplify things a little bit without being it simplistic, by the way. But, and, and I started thinking, so we've got this, this sort of gray zone of work, which I would call uh, the complex novelty space. And then sort of at the, end, the other side of the spectrum, we've got what I call the ordered stability space. What do I mean with that? It means that um, on those axes, it means that uh, we're probably working in an environment that is completely in turmoil all the time. It's changes, it's turbulence, whatever. It's not just stable, simple, predictable, and so on. I think we all know, know that what we do is highly complex and, and almost unpredictable. We're sort of aiming at a, at, a, at a moving target all the time. So the, the things that we have to produce, the outcomes that we need to create are in motion all the time. So that's, that's good, it's just part of our world. And even if the outcomes, the activities, the players were sort of on, the, on the, 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 the more simple side of things, the more predictable side of things, even the fact that we have to do those, that work in a very complex and turbulent environment just brings us into the complex novelty space anyhow. So it's sort of that, that helped me think about, yeah, what's this idea, what's this purpose, the value of HL? And I think it's, it's much needed and it's probably more needed than ever. And that's also the funny thing with, you see with HL, certainly with Scrum, it's no longer just IT and software development. There's a lot of, lot of domains, a lot of um, areas of society that are now sort of where work is just happening in the complex novelty space. It's new work, it's complex, it's highly uncertain, it's highly unpredictable. There's so much that will happen that will just ruin everything that we think we can plan. So I think we need agile more than ever. It's what I call sort of agility in the face of perplexity because we live in a highly complex environment. Um, maybe it's because we've sort of outsourced all of the routine work or the mechanical work. I don't know, maybe we've outsourced it to other regions of the world. The things that we do are all in the complex novelty space. What is education or um, IT, software development, all the other aspects of, of society. So we need HL more than ever. So that really helped me a little bit. So, and and I, I think we all know that we're still struggling with sort of the remainders of the industrial paradigm, that industrial thinking, it's, it's still bothering us. And it's certainly bothering us, at least in one way, the way that our organizations are set up. Because we're looking for more agility. Um, agility, what I call in the face of perplexity, meaning it's a complex world, and we need agility, the ability to adapt, to change, um, to answer demands, to bring out innovative stuff. We need agility in order to allow um, or to prevent complexity from turning into perplexity. Because perplexity is like uh, frozen, paralyzed, an inability to act, that sort of perplexity. That inability to act is, is a result of often very old school rigid structures. So in that sort of rigid rigidity, that, that sort of fixed structures, that, that, that is going to hinder us a lot in the future. As the world keeps speeding up and we're moving more and more work into the complex novelty space, which is highly unpredictable and uncertain, those fixed structures are almost the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. They're hindering us. Just a little message that just introducing Scrum as your new process for product and even, even wider, not just product development, is in itself not just going to magically solve the problem. It's a great start, it's a good start, but it's only a start. If you don't use Scrum to sort of update and, and change our uh, um, organizational uh, OS and, and our structures, we're still going to have problems with that. And you know, know the sort of traditional way of working, right? So over time we have separated people from functions, so all the testers together, all the analysts, and then all the product managers and the marketing people and so on, so we created those beautiful silos. But that's no problem because we'll get them to communicate via what we magically call governance in sort of, um, uh, predetermined processes and structures, we're going to say who needs to talk at who, at what point in time, sign off, handovers, meetings, and so on. 
And in order to make all of that happen, we need layers of management on top of that. Very fixed, rigid structures that will not help us survive in, in uh, the complex novelty space. And that's one of the biggest difficulties certainly with Scrum and even Agile. We don't have instructions on how to recreate or re-emerge or reinvent your organizations. We hoped it would happen by introducing Scrum and trying to do it really properly, and then finding out, oh, this is not working, let's change the organization. But then sort of the opposite happens all the time. People prefer changing Scrum to the organization rather than changing the organization to Scrum. That's, that's sort of what we hoped for, but you know, a strange world complex creatures that we are. So something's not right with our uh, organizational structures, leadership, the way that management steps in, and so on. Is it the only problem? Probably not. So uh, for the past couple of years, been consulting with a lot of organizations also, um, working with teams, uh, management levels, whatever. Um, and, and a while ago, one of the CIOs of a rather large organization in the, in the Netherlands that I'm working with, uh, so I ran and into him say, oh, Gunther, how are you doing? So glad you're here. Oh, let's have a coffee again, and, and, and please share your view on how, how we're doing. And I was, oh, my God, I, I, I must be able to tell something. So on my way home, that was sort of one hour and a half drive by car. So I, I, I gathered some, some thoughts, and uh, back home I wrote them on a, on a post-it. Wouldn't be scrum if you didn't use post-its, right? <laughs> now, this was a lo rather large post-it, by the way, because it was too many happening. So, and the... The message I brought to him afterwards at, over a coffee is that, you know what, dear CIO, your organization is introducing Scrum now in a sort of very cascaded way. So they've moved 1,200 people in certainly IT into teams, calling them agile teams, uh, going for Scrum via DevOps and so on, and, and sort of cascaded. So they formed 50 teams, 50 teams. All those teams have to go through some sort of learnings and, and trainings and, and so on. They get coaching. But I know, I was telling the CIO, the, the real problem is that you, you're looking for a sort of new organization, a new way of being, a new state that you want to bring your organization in, sort of learning organization. And that is the real challenge. The process is not the challenge. The challenge is using the process to get that sort of new spirit, that sort of new mindset in your organization. Where they're now still focused a lot on, yeah, so at, sort of at the bottom of things, so the, no, sorry, in the dungeons of the organization, they've... Now all Agile teams, they're all doing Scrum. But you know what? The problem is that those Agile teams, Scrum teams, whatever, are still being fed by top-down directives, instructions. Do this, do that. There's a deadline, and that's it. Make, make it happen. And uh, the, 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 the uh, best possible response that you will get still is reporting. Send directives top-down through all the layers of the organization to those poor people, those teams, because they're sort of the last one that can't um, send the pressure to the next level because there's sort of no level beyond them. So it's sort of painful for them. And, and obviously they're going to sort of report back and what have you then achieved by introducing Scrum or call it DevOps or, or Agile, whatever. Not, not much really. You want to go into that uh, spirit of exploring stuff. And certainly you want, instead of your management going top down with directives and instructions, you want them to sort of start participating. So go visit sprint reviews. If you want to know what's going on, please go. So join, collaborate, and participate rather than reporting. Um, a lot of companies I know in the Netherlands, by the way, I don't know, how, how is Spotify doing over here? Does anybody know the Spotify model? Who's, who's, who's going through an agile transformation using the Spotify model? Oh, not too much. Cool, cool, cool. That's great, that's great, great. Might be an indication because what I see happening certainly in the Netherlands and, and we've got this beautiful orange line company that's sort of, sort of setting a standard for the rest of Europe. Everybody thought they were going through, the, had to go through the Spotify model. Very clear what I see in my consulting, my trades in the Netherlands. So the Spotify hype is over. So that's cool. We're sort of, sort of downward again with the Spotify hype, which is good. Um, it shows also in the way that um, a lot of organizations are now, imagine starting sort of cherry picking Spotify. Yes, we're going to have squats and guilds, but not all of the other boring stuff of Spotify. I'm like, okay. So, sort of cherry picking. Uh, the same, by the way, with sort of agile coaching. There's also a uh, hype of agile coaching is over. So, in the Netherlands, the past five, six, longer, even seven, eight years, there was a lot of movement around agile, large companies, a lot of sort of, can I call them opportunists, sort of jumping on, on the bandwagon and, yeah, I, I've done this for a year. Let's call myself agile coach get a lot of money out of coaching. So we're sort of over the, over the hype also in, in that regard. Um, sort of healthy, sort of restoring of balance. 
because the real agile coaches that we now have are really good coaches. That's good. I never imagined that would ever be possible, but still it's happening, so that's good. But still, a lot of companies are still focused. Has anybody ever seen, besides the Spotify model, those, those two uh, little movies about engineering culture at Spotify? So, sort of two 15 minutes movie. Anybody seen them? Well, I know a lot of companies in the Netherlands are still focused about it, certainly management level. Yeah, yeah, we need engineering culture. When I talk to them, it's very clear that they haven't even seen the movies. Because if they would have seen the movies, they would understand that it's more about explaining the startup culture at Spotify, where they have this sort of startup spirit. It's not about development engineering practice, it's sort of the startup spirit that they have on top of Scrum. So that's sort of uh, a problem with a lot of organizations I see. They want to become more agile, they call it an agile transformation, I don't care whatever model they choose, but they're still stuck in reporting structures and, and top-down directives, but also sort of reporting or meeting culture instead of that starter product culture. It's all about meetings and being in a lot of meetings, and that's not really helpful, and that silos and so on. So that's sort of the real move, and I honestly believe that going for Scrum can really help if it helps you uh, re restore your focus on uh, building great products and services, and not just establish Scrum teams within those existing silos. Because that organization I work with, 50 teams, they were all sort of founded or started in, within existing silos. Nobody, nobody's looking at synergies across those silos, and nobody's really, um, nobody really has the courage to do that, because that you, that's where you run into team management and line management and reporting and so on. So they've got all these beautiful isolated scrum teams. They're not really collaborating, not even their product owners. They're not seeing each other as stakeholders and so on. So we still have a lot of disconnectedness within organizations. And again, rather than using scrum to overcome that, no, no, let's just um, sort of twist scrum a little bit so it fits the existing organization. It's not really helping, and, and sort of the giant leap that I see a lot of companies need to take, instead of trying to create more agile teams, try to create a more agile organization. We have no rules for that, Scrum has no rules for that, there's no agile rules for that, but that's the real challenge. And, and one of the, the challenges in doing that is just accepting that the fact we live in a very complex environment, doing very complex work with complex creatures called human beings, and the way forward is actually simplicity. Still simplicity. So that's something I, I do see happening. Spotify hype is over. Agile coaching, back to sort of real good agile coaches, not uh, money-making machines, whatever. Um, and, and also the fact that it's a lot about Scrum again. So even the company I'm working with, they, they call a lot of things that they do DevOps. But even DevOps, in, certainly in where I work, is sort of over. And it's back to Scrum. Good for me, because it's the only thing I know. So it's just no Scrum, and I, I will not engage with an organization if it's not about Scrum. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of good. It's what I call sort of the first Scrum wave. It's back to just Scrum. We've been to a sort of wave where it had to be, I know DevOps continuous delivery, save, Spotify, a lot of things happening, sort of very, very diverging. Although underneath, everybody was still looking for just building reusable versions of, of product in, in short terms, which we call in Scrum Sprint. So it's back about Scrum. And I think the real thing is that people are sort of waking up, seeing that, okay, so all those existing models that copy-paste behavior didn't really help. Let's go for simplicity again. Now, the, the very important move about um, Scrum is sort of back on the table, so it's good, it's back a uh, topic to talk about, that it's no longer just Scrum for complex product delivery, so delivering complex products, certainly IT software, maybe even other products, but just people starting to see the, the advantage of Scrum for addressing complex problems in general, not just software development. In a lot of organizations, Scrum is all over the place, and it's so huge in, in, the, in the software development uh, parts of the organization that it sort of um, s uh, sneaks through into other, other things, and people get to see, oh, we are facing quite complex challenges too. Maybe Scrum can help us too. And I actually believe that's good, because that's, that's sort of the future of Scrum. It's not just for software development, not just for product development, but in general for complex problems. Now, a bit of the problem with a lot of introductions is, um, when I work with organizations, it, it's funny, I just told you, Spotify hype is over. It seems that that sort of awakening of, of, of management so doesn't really take, take away the real belief in magic. Okay, so Spotify is not doing the trick. Let's go for another model. Let's go for your own model. What if you would create and, and develop your own model? Um, and it, so in, I don't, who knows less? Large scale for, uh, Scrum? 
Okay, who's, who's trying to do something like this? Okay, somewhat less hands, okay, cool. So that's sort of the, the next thing it seems. So a lot of companies uh, still in the Netherlands where I work sort of, oh, no, we're not going to do Spotify. I'm like, oh, cool, that's good. You want to develop your own model? No, 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 because everybody else is doing Spotify. We don't want to be like the rest. We'll go for another model. Yeah, but you know, it's still the belief in magic. Like that little big post-it. I, I sent out sort of annoyed mail to, to the CIO and, and some people of his team saying, if you really think that whatever model you're going for is going to fix the problem that your management is going to send out deadlines, not participate, not collaborate, and so on, it's really not going to happen. So just take it into account. It's also funny when I go into um, to work with, with management and executives and so on, I do a workshop. So sometimes it's one hour, but we're really busy, busy people and don't have much time for this crap. It's sort of the survival of the company, but still <laughs> with complex world dealing with that, sort of new, new uh, way of dealing with that. Um, but sometimes you get like half a day or so, and that's cool. And, and by the, so I go into workshops and I, I only know Scrum. So I talk about how Scrum scales. Actually, how can you scale Scrum without uh, implementing any existing model? Not Spotify, not even less, not even Nexus, whatever. I don't recognize Scrum in safe, so I never talk about safe. Um, but so, so there's a lot of models out there, but you can just scale Scrum without, because people sort of over, overrate or overestimate their need for scale. They think, yeah, we've got 50 teams in place, we need scale. No, but how many products are you servicing with those teams? And, how about not ignoring synergies between teams anymore? So you probably need less teams than you think. But is it believe in magic? Spotify over and everybody going for less. It's not going to help. So we'll go into management workshops, talk about those things. And by the end of that one hour or two hours, everybody excited. Yeah, we're unique. We are unique. We have to develop our own model. And then you sort of check in with them again one month, month later. Hey, how was the workshop? Did you do anything with it? How was the result? Yes, we're going to adopt Spotify or less. I like yeah, but, you know, a month ago, own model, unique. Yeah, but it's going to be easier and want to take into the lessons. Ah, yeah, okay. So sort of that belief in magic that we're still fighting. And, and that sort of magic is expressed in, in what that I've seen happening. I've been doing this stupid thing called Scrum now for sort of 15 years. Seen a couple of things around. And uh, this, is not, this is not science. This is not proven. This is not research. Just my view on things, what I've seen with a lot of companies. So they think we need to increase our agility, become more flexible speed, adaptiveness, being able to respond to the market faster, uh, restore the connection with our users, with our, even, even our teams, because our best staff are always uh, leaving the companies, some, some drive for it all. So they want to increase their agility. And it has to go quickly, linearly, fast. So, and they all think they're doing that. Until, and it takes some time, so the dot line sort of might take some time. Sometimes it's like, easily up to two, three, four years of, of work trying to improve their agility. And then suddenly they get this strange effect that certain things like sort of balloon, you, you know, when we blow up a balloon and now let it go. It's sort of some, some huge deflation. I call it deflation by reality. So they thought they were increasing their agility and then suddenly it just drops down and people start wake up. So what's happening? Sort of that second scrum wave with DevOps and continuous delivery, Spotify is safe. And then suddenly people wake up after a couple of years and longer of investing. And, and the thing just deflates. It goes down. Took a long time and then they wake up. It's not really what we're hoping it would be. And I always think, yeah, but you know what? If as from the start you would have just spent your time, hard work, vision, belief, persistence, do this. Well, a bumpy road, it's sort of cobblestone path, it goes ups and downs, it has fallbacks, it, whatever. But you know, just hard work instead of that sort of illusion you probably created for yourself. Because the actual increase in agility, my view is a lot, lot lower than if you would just have gone for hard work, iterative incremental change, doing little bits over there, little bits over there, um, probably a lot, a lot better. But it's also that a lot, of, a lot of people are stuck with what I still call old language. You know this idea of bottom-up, top-down? You know, a transformation goes in all directions. It is not top-down. It's not just bottom-up. It's left-right, top-down, right-left, inside-out, outside-in. It goes in all directions. So top-down, bottom-up, it's sort of old language. That's the industrial paradigm. It don't work like that. And then, and then people have created this illusion of what they think they're achieving. It's a lot lower, actually. And the illusion is often created by copy model behavior. 
Yeah, yeah, everybody's doing Spotify. Let's do Spotify too. Or cherry pick Spotify without understanding the underlying principles of Spotify, or how they started as a scrum company and so on. The decisions they took, the learnings they went through, go through those learnings yourself, that hard work. Or, or just sort of cascaded approach, 1,200 people IT, now 50 teams. Yeah, we're agile. I think it entangles a little bit more than just creating more agile teams. That sort of waterfallish approach, it has to be a little bit more... Uh, Radical than that. Just hard work and grow your own model. So it's my belief that if you would spend three, four years instead of trying to copy an existing model and implement it into your organization, if you would just have gone sort of small, start small, grow, evolve, expand a little bit over there, learnings, lessons, and so on, in those three or four years of, of a lot of money spent, you would have gone a lot farther if you just went for hard work and your own model, understanding principles. Sort of what I try to express in what I call reverse fire, sort of trying to help companies reimagine their scrum in order to, that first slide, reinvent or reemerge your organizations. So instead of having those scrum teams within silos, do something really radical. Look at a product, a service that has an end to end impact on your market with your users and organize scrum on that. And you know what? Organize Scrum really well. Make sure that those people have a room, have a space, the tooling, the infrastructure, have all the skills, all the expertise needed, and so on. Oh, yeah, but that's too difficult. That cuts through all parts of the organization. Well, yeah, that's the goal, right? That's the intent. So go for something radical. And then just take action. It's nothing more important than taking action. And it's just some things I've seen with Agile Transformations. Um, so they call it an agile transformation, but it seems to be just be adding work to what the teams already have to do. That's not a transformation. Feel the word. Get a taste of the word. Transforming means changing how you work, not adding work to what you already do. It's changing how you actually do your work. That's transformation. And it should be an agile transformation, meaning it should simplify how you work, not just change how you work, simplify how you work. Now, probably a lot of experts and, 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 and coaches and whatever out there, it's probably not incentivized to challenge the complexity of organizations. So it's not just simplifying product development, also simplifying the organization. So it's not a transformation if it doesn't change how you work. It's certainly not an agile transformation if it doesn't, change, if it doesn't simplify how you work. I always stick by this old idea, I know, this old school uh, agile thing, that the simplest thing that might possibly work. So what if you would go into your own organization and challenge how you work and go back to thinking about what would be the simplest thing that might possibly work and then sort of re-emerge from that. So that's sort of, and then what I also see with Scrum, yeah, you know, Gunter, we don't have time for that because we already, we're now also doing Scrum with those additional meetings and we still have to attend all the other meetings that we used to attend, have to attend too. Now, like, that's strange because if you would really organize your Scrum events in a more ritual way, you would be able to eliminate a lot of existing meetings. So this is all not just transformation, this is sort of top down on top of people and just sort of old school thing. So sort of, the belief that I thrive on is the fact that um, people are naturally agile. You don't have to make people agile. They are agile. Agile, simplest translation or synonym, synonym would be adaptive. People are naturally adaptive. I always use the, the following example. Imagine um, you're living in, in Stuttgart. It's always raining around here, always gray. So uh, the, that, that's right. It's the same in Belgium, by the way, so it's not holding it against you. So when you want to go on your yearly summer holiday with your, with your family, you want to go to the south, like really hot and so on, your old Spanish beaches or so, I don't know, or Italian, whatever. So you plan out your holiday, two weeks somewhere in Italy or Spain, beautiful, oh, a day at the beach, a day at the swimming pool, visiting a little town, visiting maybe a museum, whatever. So you make a beautiful plan for two weeks, and then you leave on your holiday, and it turns out, damn, sun was not shining the days you were expecting it to shine. You are naturally agile, you are adaptive, meaning, you know, it's thunderstorms, it's raining like last days. Well, I did plan to go to the beach. We will go to the beach. You don't, wouldn't do that, right? Changing weather conditions, change, you change your plan. People are naturally agile. You would just change. You have the ability to, to be open for change and adapt. And what if you would allow the process of Scrum to be introduced to follow that sort of natural adaptiveness that you have? And then have your structure build upon that process. We just build upon 
the, the fact that people are naturally agile. It's also this big thing, I don't know, do you have that in Germany or Stuttgart, sort of? Yeah, I, I know, I'm in Stuttgart, and, and I know, who's from Stuttgart, by the way? Any people from Stuttgart? Okay, so I'm assuming the rest is from sort of the wider region around Stuttgart called Germany? <laughs> yeah? No? <laughs> okay. So, that's cool. Um, now, people are naturally agile. Wherever you go, whatever region you're in, um, people have this natural ability to, uh, to be agile. Now, what I see happening a lot is also this, this thing about T-shape. Do you have that in Germany, Stuttgart? T-shape? Oh yeah, it's agile. We have to become an agile organization. We have to make sure that our people are T-shaped. They have skills and expertise. And I'm like, no, 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 it's the other way around. You have to remove everything that impedes, that blocks, that limits people from building on their natural ability to be T-shaped. I have never worked with a single person that was limited to one skill only. People are T-shaped by themselves. People have interests, whatever. So take away everything that is blocking them from building on that ability. That's sort of the other way around again. That's, that's very strange. Oh yeah, we now need agile HR, so we need T-shaped people. No, people are T-shaped. The only reason they don't export this sort of T-shaped abilities is function descriptions. Reviews, yearly, yearly reviews, whatever, salaries, bonuses, incentives, and so on. So change those things so make sure that people can exploit their potential to be really T-shaped. But anyhow, in, in, in the idea of structure following process, I think an agile organization, long time in the future, like people uh, or organizations re-emerging around Scrum, sort of this idea, refocusing on products and services, things that have a real impact with end users. So products is not just product physical things, but just also digital services, whatever support things that you offer. And then, and then have hubs around products, having all the skills, all the expertise, all the, all the, all the tools, whatever, within themselves. So that um, you might um, eliminate a product hub by killing a product. Who remembers Google Glass? Who has a Google Glass, by the way? No? Okay. Well, it's not around anymore, so that's just a natural thing. It's part of life. Google thought, oh, we're going to make a lot of money out of Google Glass, spend a lot of money on it, and then it was just very, very, very radical. It's not working. Let's, let's terminate it. Let's kill it. That's a good thing. Most organizations I know, they go into looking at their portfolio. You know, like that thing called, another thing in Agile, maximizing the work not done. It applies within a product, but also across products and services and projects and so on. I like, so how many products have you actually terminated over the past three years? Yeah, well, none, because you know, that those products still treat people using them. Yeah, well, and how much money are you spending on it? Yeah, but still three people using it. Yeah, well, you know, balance things. So just terminate it so that you free up energy, people, money for other uh, things. So this is sort of my belief. What if you would have an organization focused around products and services? A product hub can, can uh, grow, can shrink, can be, um, can be terminated. Um, people move to other product hubs and so on, take some time off. Sort of Googleish model. Um, also the Apple model, except the fact sort of difference between Google and Apple. If at Apple your product is killed, you'll send off to some, some, something else or whatever, you fire fired within Google, you have, like the more human approach. You can some, take some time, relax, and find another way within the organization. But still, sort of the future. And then, and then thinking in terms of Scrum, Scrum is all about products. We have a product owner, we have a product backlog. Increments are for the product. Like, how difficult can it be? It's not for projects, it's not for silos, it's not for those little things that's very, 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 super optimal. Not helpful in a way. So uh, focus on products, make sure you have a product owner. In general, people would use Scrum, mostly left-hand model for using their product delivery, using Scrum for their product delivery, which is already a good start. It will at least make sure that, I don't know whether you've ever had that in Germany, but in other countries of the world, they seem to have that, like salespeople making a release promise, and then, then product owner, go make it happen. <laughs> sort of the idea. We're trying to turn that a little bit around by saying, okay, so the focus is the product, at the heart of everything you do with Scrum is the product. You have a product owner, again, taste the word, owner of the product. Product owner actually owns the product. That was always the goal. So that means that nobody else, product management, sales, delivery, communication, marketing, I don't care, can make that sort of promises without being acknowledged or, or uh, having confirmation by the product that's actually happening. 
Huh? So, but in, in the end, those other activities are part of sort of, let's say, the, the, the wider structure. You would have a, a product hub where only the delivery is organized with Scrum, sort of defines how you would make your product backlog. Now, you can take it a step further. I've, so far, I know no organizations that actually do that, so let's, let's help them a little bit. You could organize all of that work with Scrum. So instead of making that product on the uh, sad, sad, pressured person that has to run around all the time, managing product management, um, bridging, bridging that to development and the other way around, uh, what if all those things would be handled by Scrum? You would have a, a different product backlog because it would include sales, marketing, whatever activities. So by the end of every sprint, how long are your sprints, by the way, over here? Who's going for two-week sprints? Yeah, majority. Anybody going for three weeks? Still four weeks? Oh, even four weeks. Cool. A anybody going for one week? Yeah. Well, sort of what we see, I don't know what's happening with the world, but we've got a scrum clinic for that, so you can, you can cure from that. <laughs> We've got, we've got this idea around the world that everybody's going for two-week sprints. Just nobody knows why. That's strange. Like the companies I work with, in Netherlands, let me take that one example again. So we now have 50 teams. They're all on two-week sprints and all synchronized sprints. No matter what part of the organization, what tool, what complexity, what product, whatever, all working on two-week sprints and the sort of same start stops. Nobody knows why those teams have no idea why. They're like, okay, that's sort of strange. Why if it, what if that would be part of sort of self-organization product on looking at sort of how, how frequently do not want to be able to go to the market and so on and influenced by technology complexity and so on. <laughs> then I get this strange thing in that and some organizations where I'm working with teams and, and I'm thinking through with them the sort of sprint length for so the two weeks, yeah, but is it working, not working? One of them was considering to go into three week sprints until they're sort of um, Manager two lines uh, above them found out. I'm all really angry. They are changing their sprint length without me confirming that. I, I think you probably have some long way to go before you get to understand this. <laughs> so that's cool. But anyhow, you can you can you can embed all those activities within within Scrum so that by the end of the sprint you will not just have sort of releasable, valuable increment of product, but sort of sales marketable product where all activities has been done to make it also put it into the market including also all the non-software or non-product development activities. The goal anyhow is, is to create a sort of ecosystem around your product where it's about tools, infrastructure, but it's about people. Uh, let, let me pick out the fact that it's about amicability. What if you would be able to really work together, have conflicts of ideas and still get beautiful stuff out there. So again, Going from meeting culture to that startup culture, going from delivery against deadlines to exploring and learning uh, organization. That's probably really important. So each product hub is sort of an ecosystem. It's embedded in a larger ecosystem. Um, what if organizations would think about not trying to make more money, but sort of reinvent or rethink what was our purpose again? Why do we even exist as an organization? and see making money as almost a byproduct of living up to our purpose. Of course, money is important, but what's your purpose? Why do you even exist? What are you trying to achieve? What are you bringing to the world? And, and some strange finding is sort of this one. That's sort of that move from old school organization, industrially organized to that uh, organization driving on the agile paradigm. Um, that, that manager being angry over the team, deciding to go for two-week sprints to three-week sprints, just see what happened and learn from it. Really angry, no, never going to happen, over my dead body. There's no way a team is going for three-week sprints because it would put them out of cadence with the rest of the teams. They have totally no relationship, but they have to be on the same. So we think, we still think that it's all over the place that we have to control individuals. A lot of people think that. So let me pull up this. We've got this beautiful idea in Scrum of what we call self-organization. The beautiful thing about self-organization is that it's almost an open concept. It's not, it doesn't have a clear definition, which is good because we can fill it in then depending on our circumstances. But at least the minimal level of self-organization you want in Scrum is things are not being manager-led anymore. At least a team figuring out what to do for themselves within a sprint. 
by the end of the sprint, you can go in and check again. But that's already a very difficult message to, to a lot of people saying, well, you know what? The minimal units that you're sort of working with in Scrum now is a team delivering value in a sprint. It's no longer about what individual has spent, how much hours on which sort of task. Sort of the new units in Scrum is a team as a unit delivering value in a sprint. And the rest is sort of not your concern. That's sort of not manager-led. Though I see quite some organizations where I see team and line managers actually abusing Scrum to keep control. No, it's my team and they will work as I say. Okay, well, what about products, services? What about your uh, uh, quite, quite bad customer satisfaction on the market and so on? No, it's my team. Okay, maybe, maybe try to think about the higher purpose. But there's beautiful things beyond just managing your own work within a sprint. You can be self-designing. What if a team would be accountable for hiring new skills, additional skills, additional people? Obviously, uh, working together with the product owner because it will be a budgetary impact. Uh, what, what about a team also doing the opposite? No longer needing certain people or skills within a team. What if that would be part of self-organization? That's a lot more powerful. Commitment would be a lot higher. Engagement of people would be a lot higher. That's really, really, really cool. You can go up to... Uh, Imagine your company is your product. You could be a Scrum team or a Scrum uh, ecosystem and be completely self-directing. Not just organizing your own work within the spin, but choosing your own direction, your own vision, your own sort of company strategy. So it's even, even more powerful. Now, it's, it's all about engagement, and you can't control engagement. You can't tell people how to work. So this is something, it's, it's, a, it's a, the most ugly picture I've ever made. So it's good, because it's very old. I've tried to improve on my graphical skills in the meantime. It's not working out, so that's why I'm not redoing it. So a uh, long time ago, when I was still uh, employed and, and working for companies and so on, I, I thought about this idea of that yearly performance reviews. Who has yearly performance reviews in your companies? Okay, still quite some people. Who has to fill in timesheets? Okay, so, so a couple of the least helpful things in a world of complex, uh, complex and novel work. I was thinking about what about turning things around? What if you would help people figure out for themselves, am I doing something that I really want to do? Is this really my interest? Is this something I feel I'm good at? Do I feel I have a talent for this? Or can I grow my talent for this, be, achieve some mastery for it? And is it happening in a domain that I really like to work in, with colleagues and a business and whatever I like to work in? Because from, if, if you have those things in balance, people will be, I think, feel valued a lot more. And from valuation, from feeling valued, it would help a lot. So rather than telling people to be T-shaped, what if you would be a little bit modest in approaching people and figure out, are you doing something that you really want to do, that you like to do? Do you feel you have the talent for that? If not, how can we help you uh, grow that talent if you really want to do it? And is it in the domain that you're, that, that you're happy working in? And, and this is a little personal thing, um, also from the past. Let's, let's go into sort of psychotherapy or whatever over here. Um, I have never worked for an organization where I felt almost like more than just being tolerated. It's like the organization, yeah, I'm tolerated. That's about it. I have to be careful. So tap on my toes, be careful, because I'm just being tolerated. Not really helpful if you want to do other stuff and you want to... It's not really a great foundation to really engage at most, sometimes I felt appreciated. At sort of the level I, I, I at most got. It's also sort of independent now. I've never achieved those things. So, so think about how working with people, try to think, turn things around, take away everything that impedes people, that blocks people, create an environment, foster an environment, so that in the end you flip things around and people can't, can't start thinking about innovating stuff. So it's no, oh yeah, I feel, I feel good at this company. I like this, I feel safe. So I wrote about, I uh, thought about safety a little bit. So safety is, in my view, is a safe environment. This has nothing to do with the, the framework. So a safe environment is actually an environment where people can show or demonstrate traditionally very unsafe behavior. Step up, have a conflict, talk about stuff, uh, change direction, do something differently, have conflicts over ideas, not people. Conflicts over ideas, really traditionally not done. A lot of things have to do also. I don't know, how, how are your workspaces in Germany? Do you have a lot of open offices? Yeah, okay. This funny thing is that I've seen a pattern. I, I don't know whether you recognize it. I started calling it quick, quick scrum. 
A quick, quick scrum. Yeah, we do one hour sprint planning, quick, and then it's over. I said, why? Yeah, because we have to book this meeting room because we're working in an open office. If we speak too much and too loud, people will start looking angry at us. So the very strange things that are impeding or limiting how, how much you get out of Scrum. Because you've booked the meeting room, everybody wants the same meeting rooms. So you booked it for one hour, and then after one hour, people are knocking on the door, go, go, go. And I, in, I work a lot in the Netherlands, they're very assertive people. It's not like knocking on the door, they just jump in, out, out, it's ours. <laughs> okay, yeah, but we're in the middle of sprint planning, we're talking about really fast, well, out, out. Okay, we'll continue the next sprint. Not really helpful, strange thing, so sort of quick, quick scrum. Not, not helpful. It's also not helpful in, in sort of creating engagement, commitment of people, and so on. So, sort of, I've never worked for organizations that I felt more than at most appreciated, but never went into really, yeah, letting, letting, well, letting go of things and then innovate and new ideas and, and, and fail. But it's sort of the same with, you know, innovation. You know this idea that everybody, every company wants that beautiful new, that one idea that will make them hugely successful in the sort of the new Uber on your market, whatever. You know what, that one idea, that one brilliant working idea is probably the result of 99 ideas not working. But nobody likes those ideas not working. But you know, if you don't go through the cycles of ideas not working, you will never come up with that one idea that is actually working. And I think the best, the best way to get those ideas across is that, and that's a huge shift, so from shifting from a sort of delivery deadline organization to a learning, exploring organization, startup culture, via product hubs and, and uh, very flexible structures instead of rigid structures. It, we invite people to start thinking about managing at least the environment and stop trying to control people. In, in, if you want to really thrive in the complex novelty space where it's building new stuff, innovative stuff, it's not going to help to try to control individuals. It's no longer about individuals. It's about individuals contributing to a team, a big amount, a product hub, and so on. That's also a bit of a problem with a lot of performance reviews. How can you, in a complex uh, environment, um, derive somebody's individual performance from the bigger whole. You can't, you can't sort of disseminate that anymore. That's a bit of a problem. Now the funny thing is also the colors of C, red, green. When I show this to managers, yeah, yeah, we all want that. And then you check in again with them sometime later, not really happening. So we do the best we can, hard work. Change comes in increments too, sometimes it's small increments, sometimes it's sort of baby increments, baby steps. Just accept it. Have a vision and then try to move towards your vision in, in sort of baby steps. So try to move that to that, from that old style to that new style. But just putting agile as a prefix in, in front of everything you do, it's not really helping. Calling it now agile HR is not helpful because HR in itself is just a contradiction. Humans are not resources, so try to get rid of the term anyhow. So that's not really helping. So just think about it because in the end, in Scrum, in an agile context, in a way, everybody is a manager. And it's not about the title. Manager, leader, leadership, whatever. Those are not positions. Those are not roles. Those are not functions. It's more like what you do. Those are activities. And in, at least in Scrum, in a self-organized way of Scrum, development teams or teams manage themselves. Nobody tells a team what to do within a sprint. They can be hiring, firing their own people. Why not? It's cool. They're able to do that. Create an environment where they do that. Make sure they have guidelines, boundaries within which they work. Probably invite a scrum master. Managing through this process. So not managing the people, but managing through the process. Product owners managing the, the products. Actually owning the product. And there's probably other management activities. Goals, company goals, strategies, objectives, whatever. So, and maybe you need other people for that. Maybe you need... Yeah? But it's not necessarily hierarchical. So that product hub type of situation where the organization turns into an ecosystem in itself. And then you have this. So we still think we need to control people. And I'm the manager. I'm just exerting hierarchical power over people. I feel good over that. Ah, maybe there's a little shift to be made. Now there's a huge problem I see with most organizations. We're asking people to shift to that sort of green area that we just saw on the, on the, on the slide. Um, where they sort of climbed the ladder by being on the red side of things. Elbows and, 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 and politics and power play and so on, and, and stabbing people in the back and leaving a trail of dead bodies behind. 
And now we're asking those people to just, yeah, relax, facilitate, coach, mentor, let go. Ah, not really. We we have we have some work to do. And it's not, I don't believe that they can't do that. They actually can. I've worked with quite some managers that if we just start to understand sort of the scrum master way of managing, it will really help them. I know some, a lot of team and line managers, if only they would sort of make that sort of shift towards almost turning into sort of scrum master, facilitating, managing, fostering an environment, make sure that people can actually work, that's probably going to uh, give them a better future than trying to stick to the idea of controlling because at some point in time, that controlling individuals will be over. And if you're totally focused on, if you're totally focused on just keep doing that, it feels safe, yeah, I'm sort of job protection, at some day it will be over. But that's a difficult message to get through. Yeah? So think about things. A lot of, a lot of things that I've seen happening with uh, leadership, management, and so on, um, I call the biggest impediment uh, to agile uh, our tendency to control people or control individuals. And it's not, that, it's not about those individuals. A long time ago, I, I, I told to some people, also in my book, don't label people as impediments. It's not about removing people, it's about changing behavior, it's about removing thinkings, thoughts of people, changing mindsets, so, so don't label people as impediments. It's almost like in Lean, when you would label people as waste. No, no, waste is in processes, in procedures, in structures, the same for impediments. So don't focus on the people, help them become better managers, help them to get to see the value of Scrum and move towards that sort of idea of this. Yeah. I have no idea about time. Oh, I'm pretty, pretty good on time, it seems. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's unique. <laughs> this whole crap idea of time boxing is for other people, not for me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you for my talk today. Really happy to be here. Thank you, GP. By the way, did you know that GP was...